Bill Cloud is uh, with us. He's from Shorshim Ministries. He's the founder of that and Jacob's Tent Fellowship founder. Uh, uh, welcome to the program, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you today? Very good. It's good to have you on again. So well, Good to be here. Um, tell me the, the red heifer thing. I heard back in the 90s, I think it was, people were talking about the red heifer that, you know, they're rare. But I think there was a... a I think it was an American farm, maybe Florida. I'm not. Re- I I can't remember. That had a bunch it, of red heifers, and they sent them over to Israel. Is that right? It, well, yeah, uh, I think the uh, it was from Mississippi. Was the farmer? Anyway, okay. I don't remember that. But anyway, it was back in the late nineties, ninety seven, and there was one red heifer. They even named her Melody, and I think they put her on the cover of Newsweek or Time or something like that. But anyway, you know, it created a big stir about the red heifer, and the red heifer is connected to the idea of the possibility of a rebuilt temple. And, and so, yeah, there was a lot of chatter back as far back as the late 90s. So. Okay, so there's been nine red heifers that have been sacrificed since Moses, and that's to purify the, the temple? Well, the, the red heifer is basically, thematically, it's the antidote to the golden calf. The golden calf is, you know, about rebellion, death. Moses has that ground into powder, mixes it with water. The people drink it. That identifies who's guilty, death. The red heifer, it's burned. The ashes are collected. It's mixed with spring water or pure water. And then the, those who have been contaminated, and particularly with, you know, contact with something that is dead, you're purified and you're cleansed ceremonially. And so the idea is that um, you can approach God. Where before, with the golden, golden calf, I'm not going to go with these people. If I go with them, I'll have to kill them. They're so stubborn. But then he made allowances. And so it, it is for ceremonial cleansing in order to approach God. So that's important in relation to the rebuilding of a temple because they don't have a temple at this point. Religious Jews see the temple as the uh, manifestation of God's presence on earth. They want to be able to approach God in that regard. And so the ashes of a red heifer with the waters of purification are essential if things are going to be cleansed. The temple mount, all the utensils, all the implements that go into the sanctuary, and the people who go up to the temple mount. Okay, so, so in a nutshell, in in uh, I think it was on the hundredth day anniversary of uh, October seventh, um, Hamas came out and they talked about really the red heifer and said that the Jews yeah. are going to start purifying the temple mount and you know this is a, an act of war and they knew exactly what the red heifer meant, but we've had a red heifer before. Why have we not? Why did they not? use that red heifer and make that the tenth? And why is well, this one s- supposedly the tenth? Well, the one that I re- referred to in, from 97, you know, they were watching it, but it, it actually grew some hairs that were, you know, of a different color because this red heifer has to be entirely red. There can't be hairs of a different color, which is, you know, why it would make it so rare. Right. So my understanding is at this point among these red heifers, they feel like they have some that are still qualified, you know, that would be eligible to be, you know, slaughtered and burned, et cetera. So, um, yeah, as far as the Muslim world, and particularly, you know, the, the likes of Hamas and Hezbollah and people like that, um, that that's going to get them up in arms. And so that's, that's, I would say that that's what makes it a little different, is that they're reportedly among these red heifers, some that they feel are qualified to be slaughtered for that purpose. And they've already built um, the uh, the ramp, I guess, to the altar, and they've built an altar, which I don't know if that's been done before. And they're claiming well, that before um, the Passover, somewhere you know around this time, that they're going to slaughter the heifer and burn the heifer ceremonial, ceremonially, correct? Well, from what I understand, well, let me back, backtrack just a minute. An altar, there were people who had uh, built, quote-unquote, altars in times past uh, to make a statement, a political statement. I mean, six sixty-seven religious Jews have been pushing to rebuild a temple. Mm-hmm. Um, in 1990, I was in Jerusalem at the Western Wall, and a group that wants to see the temple rebuilt came in with what they said was going to be the cornerstone of the temple. 
And it was it was symbolic. It was a protest. It was saying, hey, we're here. We're going to push for this. So through the years, there have been different things that have happened. And it seems to me it's particularly around the time of Passover when you hear all this chatter and also in the fall feast around the Feast of Tabernacles. So as far as this altar, I've heard rumors. I haven't seen anything that's absolutely verified. But here's the issue. If a group of people have red heifers and even go so far as to slaughter it and burn the ashes, um, is that going to be accepted by the you know the greater religious community? Right. Uh, that's uncertain, frankly. Yeah, because so, who has I mean, the who has the authority to do it? Well, that's just it. Um, you know, it's entirely possible, and I want to underscore that word "possible." That the group that is pushing this right now, who have these heifers, if there is one that they deem to be quali- uh, qualified to be slaughtered and burned, um, okay, so they do that. Is the greater religious community going to regard that and accept it? Here's another issue. What about the Israeli government? I yeah. tend to think they're going to frown very much. Yeah, on very that. much so. so you, you could have ashes. You, you, they could do it. They could have ashes that are just sitting there. Point being is just because you have a red heifer, and I'm not saying that's unimportant, but just because you have a red heifer, and even if they burn it, which is when I'll perk up and take notice, even then, if you have the ashes, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to start next week in rebuilding the temple. Right. Because if they if they burn a red heifer, Glenn, everybody's going to hear about it, <laughs> including the Muslim world, including the Israeli government. It's going to that would be a provocation. Now, one day it's going to happen, but is it now? Who knows? So, Bill, the the people who are doing it are the the people for the from the Temple Institute, who, from from what I understand, I was over there. I talked to some of them um, uh, while I was over there last couple of times. They say they have everything that is required to rebuild the temple. They say if the temple if it if it could be cleared so they could build it, they have everything they need to build it build it except for the red heifer at the time, you know, and permission to go up on the Temple Mount and build it. Um, is that true? Do they have everything? That's what I was told years ago. Yeah, I mean, for for years the Temple Institute has been you know creating the garments for the priests, all the different utensils, all the different furnishings. Um, and I mean, this is going back 15 years or more, you know, when I was there at the Temple Institute right. visiting, they, they said, yeah, we, we've got all of those things. The only thing that they didn't have was, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. And as you said, you know, there was a, an eligible red heifer for the waters of purification. So um, I think, you know, they're very, um, uh, very motivated to see the temple rebuilt. But I believe that they also realize that it's not just getting everything together and boom, here we go. There's a lot of things that are going to have to be considered. Um, so, you know. so what has to – we've made a lot of progress, and these things could take a thousand years to check off the last couple, um, and it, it could happen tomorrow. You never know. Um, how much – how far down the line are we on the, the known prophecy – of the things that have to happen before, uh, you know, the, the clock starts ticking for the, the return of Christ? Well, I, I think the clock has already started ticking. Now, let me say this. When it comes to Bible prophecy and being fulfilled, it is my experience that it almost never happens the way we think it's going to happen. It just always happens the way it's written. And then when it happens, we go, oh, that's what he meant, you know. So it doesn't happen necessarily according to our interpretation. It happens the way God says it's going to happen. So that being understood, here's Bill's opinion. You know, when seasons change, the weather changes. And every spring in our part of the country, and you're familiar with it there in Texas as well, when springtime comes around, you know, you have the potential for violent weather. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, sometimes we get severe thunderstorm watches, but then if the conditions, you know, worsen, then it can become a warning. Um, my opinion is this constitutes a thunderstorm watch. It doesn't mean that we're under a warning. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily imminent. Now, things can change tomorrow, as you said, and 
all bets are off and everything's going really fast. And when you say so I, that this is a warning, not a watch, you're talking about the red heifer. I'm thinking that the presence of red heifers constitutes, if I can put it this way, you know, we're under a thunderstorm watch, not a warning. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that the rebuilding of a temple is imminent. It means that there are people in the land of Israel who want to see that happen. They've been working toward that. They've been preparing for that. They're going to have everything in place when the time is right, at least in their eyes. And can I say this as well? You know, sometimes the Bible describes things that, um, well, the Bible prescribes, you know, God said, don't eat the fruit of that tree. Mm -hmm. And then the Bible describes what people do. And they ate the fruit of that tree. And so the Bible does talk about there being a temple in the last days, but does that mean that God sanctions it, or does it mean that people pushed for it? And that's a big difference. And so that's why I say our interpretation sometimes, things don't happen the way we think it's going to happen. But back to your question, where are we? I do believe we're in the last days, and I do believe the Messiah is returning. Is he going to return in my lifetime? I don't know. Nobody knows that. So in that vein, I want to make sure that I'm focusing on all the things that he said were important. And with all due respect, (laughs) he didn't say, okay, uh, be on the watch for a red heifer. (laughs) He he, he didn't. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to demean the, the, the role a red heifer will play as it relates to the end days, but that's not what he said to be on the lookout for. What he said was, you need to be careful that no one deceives you. You need to be aware of, in the last days, the lawlessness in the world is going to become so pervasive that if it were possible, even the very elect would be carried away by it. And it's going to be so bad that some people are just going to give up. They're just going to quit their faith. And so these are the things that he said that you and I need to be aware of. So, you know, sometimes, and I want to be very careful when I say this because, you know, I I've taught prophecy for you know, 30 plus years. I, I believe in Bible prophecy. I believe that God says these things and they will happen according to his will. But sometimes we can get so focused on what we think is going to happen or yeah. what we want to happen that we can lose sight of what God is actually doing and saying in this moment. And so I'm not ready to declare that because there are red heifers in Israel that there's going to be a third temple built, you know, right away. I don't know, but I, I'm not ready to say that. Yeah. If they burn a red heifer, we're all going to hear about it, I guarantee you. And if they burn a red heifer, then I'll go, oh, okay, well, let's pay attention and see what happens now. Right, because they can sit there for a long time. It doesn't, yeah, happen, it doesn't mean that they have to build it. It's just one other thing off the checklist. Right. You know, and things could be that way, and they could sit in, you know, limbo for a while, or, you know, conditions can change. Iran can decide to do something like they did the other day and wrap it up, and people, you know, uh, take that as an opportunity to do certain things. I mean, things can happen overnight, 9-11, you know, our world changed overnight. So I'm not going to discount that possibility. I'm just saying that for me, as far as this red heifer uh, component of Bible prophecy, I'd say, okay, uh, we have a thunderstorm watch. We just need to be watching and seeing what happens. Okay. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's imminent. Bill, I'd, I'd love to have you uh, back may- maybe tomorrow if you have time, because I- I'd like to talk to you about the the relationship between Russia and Iran and what we're facing there, and if that plays a role in any of the things that we are supposed to be looking for. Uh, but also, you mentioned the Ark of the Covenant. You can't have the temple um, rebuilt without the Ark of the Covenant. And there there seems to be some people that believe, don't worry, we know exactly where it is. Could I get you to come back on the program? Talk about those things? Yes. Great. Uh, sure, J- just let me know when. You got it. Thank you so much. Bill Cloud, you can uh, follow him at his website, billcloud.org. 